Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneur Show powered by The Ninja Zone, the only podcast for sports entrepreneurs that gives you an inside look into what it takes to turn your passion for sports into a business. Hey, sports entrepreneurs. I'm Scott Rudisell with Ninja Zone. Our weekly inspiration comes from your host Casey Wright's own Instagram page. Get your own daily dose of awesome by following her at Casey Wright NZ. This week's inspirational quote is from Napoleon Hill. Deliberately seek the company of people who influence you to think and act on building the life you desire. Today Casey gets to sit down with Matt Eisman perhaps best known as the host of the three-time Emmy-nominated American Ninja Warrior. He also hosts the latest spinoff, American Ninja Warrior Jr. on Universal Kids, and has helmed some of the highest-rated cable TV specials in history. Matt was actually a doctor prior to following his dreams, and then a stand-up comedian. On this episode of The Sports Entrepreneur, we talk about living the life you dream and the ability to be flexible and connecting with others. And before we jump into the conversation, just a reminder to be sure to stick around until the end where I'll give my recap and top takeaways. You can also check out all the links and show notes at thesportsentrepreneur.com. Now let's get to it. All right, guys, we have such an exciting episode today. I am here with the Matt Eisman, host of American Ninja Warrior and like 5,000 other things. Matt, welcome to the show. I got to say, when you're introduced with an article before your name is in the Matt Eisman, like the Ohio State University, or you know, it, it, it feels like it's, it's I'm, 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 I'm closing in on one name territory, like Cher, Madonna, Matt. It, that feels very special. Oh, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> you are just, I just, I find you to be such an interesting individual because clearly like the comedy comes out immediately. And <laughs> as, as many people know, I think a lot of people don't know that you went to med school. We yes. you were going to be a doctor and then Technically, I am a doctor. I, I finished medical school, got my MD, and was doing residency. So I am a licensed physician to this day. Jeez, like a real doctor. Let, let's put it this way. If you're on a flight and they call for a doctor and I'm the best that you have on that flight, pray. Because uh, it's been a while since I practiced medicine. So a lot of it has gone by the wayside. That's funny. And so you decided to do comedy. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't an either or. It really was, I was in medicine and on paper, it was the perfect career for me. I loved, I loved science. I was, I was really good at science. I was fascinated by the human body. I love people. I love being around them. And I wanted to figure out a way to combine the two and medicine seemed like the perfect career. Now, my dad's a physician. He's a world renowned physician and he never pressured me. I think a lot of people who've had parents who are doctors or lawyers feel like they're told that this is what they have to do, follow in these footsteps, these are the only careers. My dad never told me that I had to be a doctor. It was more that I, I think he just led by example. I saw, I, I have such respect for my dad. He was, he's a tremendous father, but he's, 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 he's a tremendous man. And he worked so hard at his career and he, he derived such satisfaction from it. And I respected him so much and saw how people respected him. And I thought, that's what I want. I want, I want to, I want to be like my dad. And when I got into it, I realized I am not my, my dad. And I, when I got into medicine, particularly when I got into residency, so I had my MD, I was, I was uh, doing my training at the university of Colorado where dad was a professor. And you just, that's when I started to realize this isn't a job, this is a calling. And, and it was one of the things where it fit perfectly on paper, but you don't live your life on paper and as I got into it, I just realized my heart wasn't in it the way it needed to be. So it wasn't when I left medicine, it wasn't as though I said, I have to be a comedian. I've had this epiphany. It was more, I, I just had this feeling that medicine, I didn't have the passion for it. And I felt awful. It, it was awful going into the hospital feeling like I'm not here doing the best I can for my patients. And I wasn't doing the best I could for myself. And that's, that was what prompted me to take a break. And, and then I thought, 
Okay, so I knew I needed to take a break. Then I thought, what can I do? I, I could be a ski bum. I could travel the world. I could just just to clear my mind. Because honestly, I thought, look, take a year. I'm I, I'm an immature person. I thought if I take a year, I'll grow up. I'll realize I'm lucky to have this job and this opportunity. I'll come back refreshed and recharged and be a doctor the rest of my life. And I thought, what could I do? I've never done it. I've never done anything creative in my life. I always grew up. It was sports and school. And I thought, you know what? I've done stand up a few times in med school. Let me just try comedy as a way to do something completely different, thinking. I'll open up my mind and that will bring me back to medicine. And that was the plan. It wasn't as though I thought I'm going out to Hollywood never to come back. I thought it was I'll grow up doing doing this immature thing. Instead, within about three weeks, I realized, oh, my God, this is what I meant to do. I meant to have an audience. I meant to perform. And I'm so happy that I took that leap because I think that was one of the hardest things is you're walking away from a career that is respected, that is, that is, you know, uh, pretty secure and that I'd worked so hard for and made financial sacrifices for to walk away to go to something as absurdly self-centered and, and, and uncertain as comedy doesn't make sense on paper. But again, you don't live your life on paper. I loved it. And I just felt like this is what I was meant to do. And I knew the one thing I'd learned about myself is I'll work hard. I will absolutely grind. But if it's something I'm passionate about, it, it's not even hard work. It's just I love doing it. So I kind of felt confident once I discovered my passion for it, like I will figure out a way to make this work uh, one way or another. Um, I know that I'm going to bring such a passion to it and early on. And I just had a confidence, I think, that that I, I'd i grown up a younger brother. I loved being the center of attention. I thought, you know what? I'll find a way to uh, make my way through this world of entertainment. And, and it's worked out. I've always admired comedians and I admire physicians as well, but I've always really admired comedians because of how <laughs> fast, I mean, the, just the, the processing, I mean, just the, the, the quickness and how fast things have to bounce back and forth between the sides Absolutely. of the brain to connect things. And I think comedy and like entrepreneurship are really go hand in hand because it is about bringing, it's, it's about bringing those multiple things together and bringing real life to the world. That's exactly it. I think is, is it, you, you really hit it is, is cause I'm I, essentially, I'm a, I am my own business. And one of the things you realize is you, you can't plan life. You can't plan how your business is going to go. I can't plan how my career is going to go. I can have an idea, but I can't control what opportunities I get. So the ability to be flexible, the ability to respond in the moment is, is something you have to hone and it's a gift and you're right. And that's something I think that comedy has really developed in me. I think that has been one of the best traits, particularly as I got into hosting is that ability to stand up on a stage and say, I've got this. I've got some ideas, but I can respond in the moment. And I think when you talk about being an entrepreneur, um, you know, that's, the, that, that's what I've been doing now for 19 years. I've been self-employed. I'm a freelancer. I'm, I'm only as good as the job that I have. And that job can go away literally in the next day, the next week. You never know. So you're always looking for that next hustle and you're always working to develop connections. You're always working to develop your skill set so that you are more marketable. Um, and, and you always, I always look at every job. I know every job is going to end. Uh, American Ninja Warrior has been the best gift. We're heading into season 11, but eventually it will end. And so I, I'm doing my best to make it last as long as possible, but at the same time to say, what comes next? And I, I think that's what being a small business owner is is figuring out, all right, I've got this plan and you know, God bless it, let's hope it works. But I'm going to have to adapt. I'm going to have to figure out how the market changes and be nimble and and listen. Listen to, you know, that's one of the things as a comedian we always talk about is you might think you're a dirty comedian or a clever comedian or wordplay or something. But there's also a bit of the audience or the marketplace will tell you what what they want from you. And you don't always have to give them exactly that. But it's wise to say, 
all right, I'm putting out a product, but these people are liking a certain element of it. Maybe I should listen and see if I can develop that and find that happy medium because people will tell you what they want with their dollars. You put that very eloquently. And I love how you're always thinking about the next thing. And I think it's a good... It's a good segue when speaking of American Ninja Warrior and what it's brought you in your career, but how it's just brought life to so much and how one, how one thing, one shift in what is valuable to the people, to the market can just create this whole industry of possibility for so many more people. So let's talk about that a little bit. Like what, not only what American Ninja Warrior has done for you and your career, but what do you see, what possibilities has it brought outside of, I mean, just the possibilities that you've seen by being on the show for, for this long? Well, what I've loved is, look, for me, obviously, it's it's been amazing. It's it's been uh, something that's given me a tremendous platform. It's it's introduced me to so many people and offered so many opportunities. But what I've seen on a much larger scale, on a much more important scale, is how it's transformed the lives of not just the athletes who participate, but the audience who watches. And American Ninja Warrior has been a big part of it. But I think that it, we 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 were also very fortunate to be the right show at the right time um, in that I think there was, you know, people used to just be content working on a treadmill and kind of say, I'll do 30 minutes on a treadmill. That's my workout. And I think people were getting antsy for something bigger. And so, you know, we were a- around the time of the rise of the the Spartan race, the Tough Mudder, these OCR races and and where people were looking for a challenge. And I think the, the thing I saw with American Ninja Warrior that we did probably better than most any other show was to show athletes of all different backgrounds. I mean, we've lowered the age to 19 now. So 19 to 77, four feet eight to six foot 10, to have people with stage four cancer, people with substance abuse, or people who have uh, blown out their knees, or people who are Navy SEALs or NFL players, to have, uh, you know, Casey Catanzaro, the five foot tall gymnast, and and then to have Cam Wimbley, a defensive tackle for the Tennessee Titans out there. We're the show where everybody competes on the same platform, on the same course. And But most importantly, this is one of the few shows on television where it's in such a cutthroat, especially when it started, I think, particularly reality TV, was so cutthroat, crowning a champion, only one person wins. And this was the complete opposite, where we've only had one winner. Only two people have completed the course in 10 seasons. It's a show that theoretically has more failure than any other show. Every single athlete who's participated on the show has fallen. Even Jeff Britton and Isaac Caldero, the two guys who've completed it in previous seasons, have fallen. Isaac fell that season in the in the city finals. Everybody's fallen. And yet when you watch the show, it doesn't feel like failure. You see success. And the the best thing about it has been the stories and and that people see someone going out there with type 1 diabetes or with autism and the amount of the response we get on social media that's when i knew this was something special is when someone goes out there gets through one obstacle and it's the most celebrated run of the night it's the one that people are talking about because it it shows them that these limitations that we see are are so often self-imposed and it's not as though you know you have to hit a buzzer to be a winner on American Ninja Warrior. You're not competing against the other athletes. You're competing against who you were the day before. And I think that's such a good message for kids. And, and again, I'm not a participation trophy guy. I think I, I like winners and losers. I played sports my whole life. But I also like the message of, look, just because you're not the best at something doesn't mean you still can't participate and derive great benefit from it. And what we've seen with Ninja Warrior is – This community that's arisen of these ninjas that welcome athletes from all levels. There's no hierarchy. I I go to a gym. I've been to multiple gyms and we'll see our best ninjas welcome people around their first day. And there's no, Hey, get off that obstacle. That's only for, they're like, Hey, what, you know, how can I, how can I get you interested in this sport that's given me so much? And it's such a unique experience that has brought so many people. I think to a different level of fitness or to say, Hey, you know what? I don't have to be the best, but I'll start with one pull up and let's see where it goes from there. 
the community that comes together in some of these, uh, I, I call them sports fitness fusions. It's great because everybody gets to play together. And I think in a lot of sports, it becomes so level driven that it, it segregates everyone. And especially for kids, which is my space, you know, if they don't start at a certain age, then they can't play with their friends. And <laughs> we've lost this notion of what are sports for. And so you see these sports fitness fusions emerge because it truly is a lifestyle and people are starting to get get smart and say, hey, this is a, a journey, not a destination. And that's what you see with American Ninja Warrior and with OCR and with, you know, a lot of the, um, call them like discovery sports, like parkour and tricking and the, the things where you learn your own body by doing. Uh, CrossFit is a, another good community example of you can be competitive, but it can also be a lifestyle. CrossFit is a cult. It is amazing <laughs> how these people, but, but what it is, is it's accountability. And so often I think that's, what's great about having a community is look, I've realized I played team sports my whole life, football, basketball, baseball, uh, played baseball in college. And it was always easy to just show up and work with team, work with your teammates. Cause you didn't want to let your teammates down. On my own, I suck. I'm lazy. I'll go work for 15 minutes. I need a class. I need the structure. I need the discipline. I need to know someone's next to me going, come on. You know, like even if they're not saying it, I feel like I feel this thing of I don't want to I don't I don't want to tap out. I'm going to complete this hour no matter how much pain I'm in. I used to see it as as like, oh, it's a weakness. I'm lazy. And I'm like, you know what? Accept it. This is who I am. I need this external discipline. So I go to the gym and I sign up for classes and I'm like, and in the class, I'll do great. And it's this thing of so often, I think we we're so hard on ourselves if if we don't, if we can't, if you see someone who's like, I get up at 5 a.m. and I run 10 miles on my own. Great. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're a self-starter. That's just not me. But that doesn't mean I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm necessarily lazy. It just means I need a different type of motivation. And sometimes it's external. Um, so I, I, and I think that's one of the great things is, when you find that, because because I think a lot of people are like that. I, I I think most people will work harder in a group um, when there are people around them, or it's like you know what I want to tap out. Come on, five more minutes. All right, Steve, if you're here, I'm doing it. Let's go. And and so to find that group, and that's what I think Ninja Warrior has afforded these people is, and we've seen it. We saw this. This was one of the early things I saw in my very first season. We had a boot camp where we took these athletes together and we saw it was, I felt like Darwin, the monkeys are learning together. Like the way you <laughs> saw these athletes teaching each other. And so one of them would figure out like a pincher technique on, on the hanging doors and, or the floating doors. And, and then they would share it. Another guy goes, yeah, but if you, you know, you crab your hands up top and you saw them sharing these tips and getting better faster together than they would on their own. Absolutely. Such a good life lesson. I think that, that the whole point of this to me is when I look at sports and I look at, you know, whatever you do, having participated in a sport and learn, learning discipline, learning that hard work is the way you get better, learning how to take harsh criticism from a coach and realize it's meant to be constructive, learning how to fail, learning how to succeed. These are such important life lessons that whatever you do are going to make you a better person, particularly in the workplace. Um, and so I think these are the lessons that for a lot of kids who I look at Ninja, these are a lot of kids who didn't play football, basketball, or baseball. They're not the traditional athletes. Um, and, you know, for girls who did gymnastics, that's great. Not a lot of guys do it. And that's why I'm so glad Ninja is getting in there to introduce some of these guys to gymnastics. Because I think gymnastics is such a strong fundamental base for whatever you do in life and just for general fitness in terms of strength, flexibility, body awareness, discipline. Um, so whatever it is, whatever gets people into sports, I, I think serves them well in the long term. Well, you mentioned uh, when you were talking about the boot camp and you said we took these athletes and seeing them come from you know all walks of life. I think that the the emergence of this sport really brings out the athlete and not the player. And I think that's a key distinction that we've, we've lost a little bit as, as especially the legacy sports have grown. Um, the coaching has gotten incredibly technical and, and plays and, and roles and work. Year around round sports, baseball, yeah. you know, playing lacrosse year round, one sport when you're 10 years old. 
and they're not athletes. And what you've seen and what American Ninja Warrior does is it brings out the true athlete, like the nimble, the coordination, the, um, the, that person that can just get up and do anything they can kind of put their mind to. And competition, albeit I love it, sometimes it drives, it's driving these kids to like a single result and we're forgetting the big picture. Absolutely. Especially when you're young, especially when you're young, I think sports are about, look, I think, again, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm in favor of competition at times. I think it's the, you know, the losing and winning is good, but initially it's like, learn how to play the game, learn how to be an athlete, learn the lessons that when you get competitive in high school or more importantly in college, or, you know, if you're fortunate enough to go to whatever level, that's when you can really focus on winning and losing. But you're right. There's burnout. It's just, it's too much too early. Like we played, we, we would play three sports year round. You know, you, you're always switching sports and, and you never get bored. And you're in, and I, I know Urban Meyer at Ohio State has said, I don't want a guy who's played football his whole life because uh, he's, he's going to be somewhat limited athletically. I want someone who's a well rounded athlete because I can teach you football. Athleticism, that's much harder. I want someone who's developed that, who's worked on their balance, their hand-eye coordination in all these different ways. Um, and, and I think emotionally too, just, just that, that variety that, that keeps it fresh for you. So it doesn't feel like a job at 11 years old. Absolutely. I mean, you think as adults, I mean, our workout routine, I mean, who does the same workout for 18 years? You know, particularly with something like baseball, where I'm a pitcher, I'm favoring one side of the body much more heavily. And so uh, it's it's just I, I I think that it's it's been interesting this this rise of this specialization at such a young age and this feeling and I think a lot of it is look if my kid doesn't do this they're not going to be able to get on the right travel team which means they won't play in high school which means they'll have no shot at a scholarship and I think parents are all kind of planning these kids' lives out and and with the best of intentions but at the same time you look at how many kids are just quitting going. I just, I, this isn't fun. This isn't fun anymore. Or they become these hyper competitive little beasts, which, you know, I think is, 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 can also be unhealthy to a degree, like where there's, there's a certain amount of, Hey, you know, don't forget, this is a sport. It's not live or die at, at age 11. Like I, again, I, I don't want to contradict myself. I want someone to have the winner's attitude and try their best, but not to the point where when they go home, they're crying and can't sleep because you lost a little league game at age 11. Well, I think it has a lot to do with what we teach them at what age and being really able to understand kids and how their brain develops and what they can understand and the concepts that they can grasp and what's important to them at each age. And, you know, when I take my little ones to the doctor at their, you know, six and eight year old checkup, it tells me it's like, oh, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I am. I mean, they're not all that different, you know, right. like there's certain milestones. And you, as you were talking about these sports, I funny little story. I, our family went to play putt putt and my son was four and my husband was like, he wanted to put the ball right next to the hole. Right. So he could get it in the hole. And my husband's like, you can't do that. You can't cheat. You got to move back. And, and I'm like, what, what's the goal here? It's, it's to have fun as a family and get him to maybe like putt putt. But if you put him back here, he's going to throw his club and we're going to all leave with the four-year-old screaming because he can't get it in the hole. <laughs> like what's the goal? Hey, it is. I think, you know, and that's, that's the challenge when I look at a place like Ninja Zone or, or with Ninja Warrior or something is particularly when somebody's starting out, the goal is they're not going to have that early success most of the time. So how do you build interest? How do you make them feel like, Hey, you did great. Where you are, you're doing great. And to get them excited to come back and to put the work in, you're right. That's such a challenge that I think, which, which comes down to great coaching and a great understanding of what motivates most kids and then how to reach, you know, different kids who are more competitive or some kids who just despise the thought of competition. But you're like, look, you can still be out here and be physically active and still, still make this fun. I think that's, that's the adult's challenge because, you know, there really aren't any bad kids. They're just kids who haven't been taught right or been exposed to the right thing. I think kids are, you know, they, they have their personalities, but there's also that's where, uh, you know, adults really can step up and make a huge difference. 
and understanding how they how they process information and how just imagination and silliness can completely change the direction of of a child. We've having fun. Totally having fun having and fun. totally being able to teach those lessons like being able to fall and laugh about it and you know ninjas love hard stuff and ninjas make mistakes and it's uh it's just it's been American Ninja Warrior, the the emergent of, you know, things like parkour and then just being a, there's, there's just been a big hole, especially for little boys in, in our space. There just wasn't a lot for them to do because quite frankly, they're, I would say a little harder to handle at the younger ages. Their attention span is a little shorter. Generally. We want to run. We want to oh smash stuff or jump or get yeah. crazy. And to tell them to sit still is like, I remember recess, we had to go out and play football and run and exhaust ourselves. We had, we would have two recesses a day because they're like, you you guys got to burn off some energy. There's schools that are putting more of them in now because it's working. It's making their grades go up because it's like you have all these little, I mean, you have energy that you have to get out. It's got to be channeled. <laughs> That's why I don't like. I don't like when they medicate these kids or say you you have attention deficit dis- disorder. It's like no, you're a little boy. Little boys are rambunctious. I was a ram- my, my mom called me the little wild one because I just I would run around. I would scream. I loved attention, but it was just like just had energy and, and and so figuring out how to channel it productively and to teach them like that's good. What you got is good. Now save it for her. Save it for ninja training. I have this dream and I actually haven't shared this, but I'm kind of excited about it because I, I feel that there's a direct correlation with as that energy is releasing, it activates the brain and it, for learning. And I know this because I was never a reader in school. If I opened up a book, I would fall asleep. But since audiobooks have come out and I put that on and I run or I get on the elliptical or whatever I do... I absorb so much more information and I would love for a way. I mean, our our tagline in Ninja Zone is turning energy into ambition. Oh, that's great. And those kids, the very ones like you that are like literally jumping from the inside out as a child to be able to channel that into how do we use that to absorb academics and information. I just, you know, I am... It, it would probably be another 20 year project, but I no, would. But it's, it's so great. I think when, when we realize not everyone's the same, not everyone responds the same, not everyone learns the same, not everyone's the same athletically, not everyone trains the same or, you know, and, and, and to be flexible enough rather than to say it's done this way, but to say, let me figure out how we do it for you. And I think, you know, it's, it's obviously hard if you have 30 kids and you're a teacher where it's like, okay, I'm kind of limited. But I think that's where, you know, a sport or something can come in or a coach can can offer this insight or, you know, a parent who's really attentive and, and, and saying, all right, what works for my child? And maybe lightening up on the on the rules of what they need to have by when, because if those weren't there, we wouldn't be in a hurry, right? Just have fun. Do your best, but have fun. Well, Matt, I, I, I want to come back to you before we wrap up. I, you really have done a little bit of everything with your own personal brand and just your, your creativity and your intelligence. And I've seen you do cartwheels and (laughs) not the best cartwheels if we're being honest, but I do them. (laughs) Just, and you know, you got the whole smart thing going on. I'm like, he's like Mr. America, if there was one, but I, I'm really curious to know, like, how do you know? when you're ready for something else. I mean, I know you mentioned, you know, hustle to the next thing, but like y- you've, you've bounced a bit. Like when do you know you're feeling called to do that next creative endeavor? It's, it's hard. I think, um, I, I think you just start to feel this anxiety, uh, or, or, you know, I knew, I knew in medicine, I remember call, I, I called it the Sunday blues. Like if you remember in school, when, you know, you'd be having the weekend and around the, this time of year was the worst when you'd have that, that four day Thanksgiving weekend, but then Sunday came around, you're like, Oh God, I have to go back to school. And you had that pit, that dread. And if you have that feeling when you're doing something, and again, look, I, I realize I'm, I'm extraordinarily fortunate in what I do and that it's, 
It's absurd. It's, it's, uh, you know, m- there's so many people who, who are working in a factory for 10 hours a day and they're putting food on a table and they don't like it, but they're being responsible. And I, I think that is so, that's awesome. That's noble. That's great. I'm lucky enough that I've gotten to choose a profession that I love. And, you know, for people who, who have some latitude or who have some dream in the back of your mind, who say, well, what am I supposed to do about it? Look, there's no secret. Do it. You know, you start out, you start out, I'm not saying, particularly if you have a family and you have responsibilities, I'm not saying you walk away from your responsibilities, but I'm saying you start slow. You start going to the open mic or you start going to the gym for, you know, 15 minutes a day, whatever it is, you find a home gym, but you start doing it because the reality is if, if something's calling you and you start doing it, you'll know, you will know if, if that passion is there and if that motivation is there. And that's the thing that you have to have because particularly in what I do, it's a business of no, I'll do, you know, I've had, I've been unbelievably fortunate and yet still out of a hundred things I go for 98 times, the answer is no. And, and so you really have to have, you have to have a sense of self and a confidence and then, and a belief that I'll make this work. For for people who are out there who who have some urge or some desire, there's never going to be the right time. There's never going to be a perfect opportunity. You have to create it, and you do it. You do it. it you know, I I remember when people talked about the secret, thinking there's some mystical power. It's not mystical. When you commit to something, you open your eyes to other opportunities, and you'll see things. You will notice things that were there all along. Um, you'll make connections that were there that you just didn't know. If you, if you, if you talk about it, someone may say, Oh my God, you know, I, I, I happen to know somebody who's, who's a professional singer. And if you want, I can introduce you if you want to sing. And, and, and it's amazing how by, by, by speaking, by, by putting it out there in the universe, it's not mystical. It's connections. It really is this thing of when you put that energy out there and, and, and let people know, I, I'm looking for something. I want to find some new passion. People are always excited to, I think, offer any connections they have. And, and the reality is the worst case scenario is you fail, you end up with some great stories and you go back to where you were, but you scratch that itch, you know, because you don't want to live your life waiting for that moment going, it never happened and live with regret. Take your swing. And again, you know, I'm not saying walk away from your job if, if you have a family. I'm saying figure out a way to do it in small steps. You can do it because we see it on Ninja Warrior. We see people who have jobs, who have families, who are battling unbelievable obstacles in life, be it a loved one with multiple sclerosis or serious diseases or substance abuse or the loss of a loved one, whatever it is. And people will find a way for something if it's important enough, if you have that passion for it. And I think that's what it comes down to is. A lot of people think they want to do something, but if you really have the passion for it, you'll find the time. You'll find a way to make it happen, but you just got to start taking those steps and opening yourself up and looking for the connections and the networking and the possibilities that are already there to get you on those first steps. That's wonderful advice. Uh, Wonderful advice. And I firmly believe all of what you just said. And I firmly believe that that's why you're on my podcast because I put it out there (laughs) to the universe. And here's the other thing that's (laughs) amazing too is, you know, with Twitter, with social media, we have an access that is unprecedented where, where again, you you know, we, we'd met before, uh, God, it's been three years, four years, but, but, but it's that thing of, People will reach out to me on social media and be like, Hey, would you, would you do a podcast? Or if I'm going to be in town, can, can we, you know, meet up for a coffee or something? I'm like, yeah. And, and, and not like I'm a huge star, but I'm telling you, you, you'd be surprised how if there's someone you're interested in, if there's someone who might have a connection, you can reach out to these people now. You have access to them. It is one of the greatest tools that is sitting in the palm of your hand. And, and just by, by making these connections, it's amazing what you can learn, asking these questions or even just following them and listening to what they say and do on a daily basis. There are so many people out there from whom you can learn and social media and books on tape. It's, we, have, we have access that we've never had before. Wow. Listening to Matt talk about his life is truly inspirational, and he brought up some really great points this week. Here were my three key takeaways. Number one, just because something looks good on paper, 
you don't live your life on paper. If your heart isn't into something the way it needs to be, then you owe it to yourself to do the best for yourself. Number two, you can't plan life and you can't plan how your business is going to go. You can't plan how your career is actually going to go either. You can have an idea, but you can't control what opportunities you get. So the ability to be flexible, the ability to respond in the moment is something you have to hone. You're only as good as the job that you currently have, and so you're always looking for that next hustle, and you're always working to develop connections. And finally, number three, if you have a dream in the back of your mind, something you feel you are supposed to do, there's no secret to getting started. Just do it. There's never going to be the right time. There's nothing mystical about it. It's connections. All right, that's it from us. Now we'd love to hear from you. Tweet at your host, Casey, at CaseyWrightNZ, or shoot us an email at podcast at theninjazone.com. As always, be sure to use our hashtag, the sports entrepreneur, on social media. Wonder what this whole ninja thing is anyway? Head over to theninjazone.com and learn more about what we do. Okay, that's it for now. Join us next week for another conversation on how you can turn your passion into profit.